My question is for all of you on the panel. Um, recently, on August 18th, um, four Algonquin First Nations uh, did a call for protection of the Algonquin's uh, sacred area. Um, they opposed the rezoning of, of this area for, Z for windmill development to do what they're going to do or planning to do. Um, and um, so th those were, I believe, Wolf Lake, Eagle Lake, Temiskaming, and Barrier Lake. Um, I, if I, not, I can stand corrected on that, but I believe those are the, first, the four First Nations that uh, are, are whatever to call to, against the development. Uh, so my question is, um, are, Alg are Algonquin people divided on this issue? Um, and, and if so, how can, you know, non-Indigenous people, and how can even like other Indigenous people that are not Algonquin, how do we, how, how do we act in solidarity or how do we, how do we negotiate this? Because it feels like we're, we have to pick a side or something um, and it's, it's an interesting place to be. Maybe we'll start with uh, Chief Kirby. No, I think you're right. Those are the four First Nations that have uh, put out a resolution opposing the development and that it become um, a park. So even there, there's, there's a difference of opinion to have the land back the way it was or to have it a park. So those are, those are really two different things. And uh, since that petition came out or that uh, resolution of opposition, um, I have contacted two of those chiefs and they are very open to having a meeting with uh, Pick Walk On as well as the developers to find out more details and facts about the development and what uh, the intent is. Um, for example, one of the chiefs did not know it was private property. And he said, I'm surprised that I, I did not know that. So he said, that's a bit of a different thing, he said. And I have uh, phone calls and emails sent out to the other two chiefs, um, one who I know uh, for a long time. I know three of those chiefs fairly well. And the fourth one, um, I've heard of him before, I believe I met them. And I know they're all open to the discussion. And uh, I think as, uh, as uh, probably Shadi has said, the more people listen to things, understand the complexities, then I think there'll probably be some kind of compromise and um, maybe different opinion or views on things. So I think that has, has to discuss that, like, like Shadi said, that has to happen with the Algonquins. So I know that, as we're going to talk about some of the history, the one is that the Algonquins, there was many petitions by the Algonquins concerning the territory and land, and very concerned about the fact that it's being settled and patented. In 1836, there was at least two petitions by the Algonquin nation, by the Grand Chiefs, and then signed by the uh, the uh, sub-chiefs who were probably chiefs of each First Nation, such as Pakinwatik, Kitigan Zibi, and uh, Michelle Mokwa, whose son became the first chief of Pekwakanagan when the reserves were created. And they said, we do not want to disturb people in their private property. We we're looking for compensation, and we would like to be maintained in the remainder of our unpatented or unsettled territory. So we've adopted that principle and on the Pekwakanagan side, that we don't want to turn around and start telling people what you can or can't do with your private property, but you have to make sure there's some archaeological assessments done in case there's artifacts there or burials, and also ensure there's economic and non-economic environmental assessments done properly to ensure that there's no impact or negative, negative harm. And that's our kind of position so that People don't feel insecure that the Algonquins are coming after my private property. There's lots of development happening in Ottawa. There's lots of people settled in Ottawa, lots, and people out here, including the naysayers and protests, who probably have property in Algonquin territory. So my question would be, do you want to start the ball rolling and say maybe, let your property revert to the way it was and hand it over to the Algonquins? That maybe that's where it should start as a, as a sign of good faith. So, uh, Josie, how about you? Um, do you think that the Algonquin Nation is divided? If so, how, how should the rest of society respond to that? 
it's most definitely divided and extremely frustrating. Uh, start off with the First Nations people. Me being somewhat on the, well, on the inside of this, sitting on the Memogweshi Council, I can tell you firsthand that some of these communities and chiefs that have come forth with this band council resolution are also from the same communities that were reached out to for consultation a very long time ago, and they chose to ignore our invitation. So I wanna make that very clear right now, because a lot of people don't talk about that, and that's the truth. Now, a lot of these other communities as well, they come from, well, their, their communities are in dire straits. Their communities are in need of something revolutionary like this. I'm sorry people, but we live in a day, an age, where everybody's financial sustainability is on the line. When I'm talking about the non-First Nations people that are opposing this project, some of their strategies are a little embarrassing. For example, today I walk in here and I see ZB is racism written in chalk on the sidewalk. The information that they choose to put out there in you know, uh, media outlets such as Anishinaabek News or The Lowdown, their facts aren't even correct. Still to this day, there are people from that same group that think that ZB is on Victoria Island. It is not. That pristine sacred land that keeps getting thrown around, which no doubt, Victoria Island definitely is. The rest of these lands are contaminated waste. I just went on a site tour last Monday for the first time. I got to go inside these buildings. I got to walk all around the islands, every nook and cranny. I'm sorry, but those lands need to be saved. Turning it into a park is going to be almost impossible. I'm not saying it is impossible, but where is the money going to come from? Oh, but you know, you have windmill that's here. They're getting, they have the money, they're gonna do it. They're gonna save this contaminated wasteland and turn it into something revolutionary. So moving to Islan, uh, Shadi, do you wanna yeah. wage in on this uh, question? Yeah, I think we've been duped. So I think that, that within being, by being colonized, indigenous people as a whole have been tricked into thinking that we have to be united to be a strong, powerful people. Even though the colonizers were never united, Britain, France, Germany, Austria, all the countries in Europe were never united. They were, everybody respected their own autonomy, their own right to do what they wanted to do. Now, we can be divided and that's okay. We don't have to fight. It's okay to have different beliefs and it's okay to have different values, even amongst your own people. And this is something that I think it affects not just the Algonquin people, but just about every indigenous group in North and South America that has been colonized. You look at, you look at conflicts in a lot of the Iroquois territory over, over things like gambling, casinos, and poker. The fact that people believe that they have to be united in order to be a prosperous nation. Well, you don't. We can have we can be divided, we can have a difference of opinion and still be a prosperous nation, just like every other nation that's ever existed. I don't know why indigenous people are held to this double standard that we somehow have to be better than everybody or more united than everybody to be prosperous. I think that we're human beings and as human beings we can be divided and still get along and move forward and build. I'm a big fan of uh, Star Trek, so like, you know the, the, you know the, the, the idea in Star Trek that you, um, you don't interfere with another group's culture or development, um, or what well, the prime directive exactly? I, I, have made, I have a lot of faith in the prime directive, and I believe that currently uh, Indigenous people are on a trajectory of like uh, of change that uh, we're we're catching up with the world, and we're uh, you know we've um, we've been held down for a long time, so our process of catching up has been a bit slower, but we are catching up. And catching up means we need some space. When there is a conflict between uh, an indigenous group, when there is a divide uh, uh, between us, we need to be left alone to deal with that. It's just like the case that people say uh, to the United States, stay out of the Middle East, stay out of Iraq, let them deal with it, let us, and, and as an Arab person I can say this as well, interference doesn't help. Jumping in the middle and taking a side and picking a side, and it doesn't help. We need to be left, you know, to our own. Just for a little bit, not forever, but just until we can catch up to where you guys are at. Because, uh, you know, we're on that road right now. And when, um, when Europe was developing and catching up, 
people didn't jump in and say, you got to do it this way, you got to do it that way. We didn't go over there and say, well, we're going to take this side and we're going to choose this side because we favor over another. And we need that time to figure out who we are in this world in 2015 because the world has changed from the last time that we were repressed and couldn't do anything. Um, so yes, support, help, be there. Uh, just don't interfere, I guess is my, my message. So moving along, uh, Verna, what do you think? You know, I'm kind of thankful, yes, there's this conflict with this, but I'm thankful that this uh, whole process happened because what did we learn, what did I learn from it from a macro level, coming from a community level, was also to as well, where was our protocol for consultation? Because uh, yes, there's uh, different chiefs putting forward uh, the positions on on this project, but my question is, having been involved in some of the meetings, I'm saying, well, where are the other band members, or where it was only a select few that were invited? There's a need for a consultation framework, so that even when elected officials come forward and make a statement or issue press statements, that they have the backup and saying we've consulted based on even uh, the an initial survey, uh, our initial membership, that, because that's what elected officials are for, to represent the people. For us, as Native people, recently, for example, in the Supreme Court, you've had the Chicolton ruling prior to that, the Gulmuk, and this also evolved to this duty to consult so again to what is consultation? And if we had a framework, it, it would also eliminate a lot of, um, it, it's almost like what happened here was piecemeal. Everybody's coming from this side, this side, this side, and we're not sure how informed they are of the whole situation as well. Like you mentioned, there was a mention, oh, people still think that they're gonna be developing on Victoria Island. The other part is, uh, so it, there's a tendency to be black and white, or good and evil. I was coming in this morning and I was listening to this song and I was, I was thinking, I think spirit works in, in uh, mysterious ways. There was a song I never heard before and, and I was like, talking about, you, you need a little red to your black and white. <laughs> and I'm thinking, Oh my God, that's what uh, we're dealing with, this issue. They want to keep it black and white, and sometimes it's not black and white. I'll give you a quick, 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 quick example from my community perspective. I was, I'm a former economic development officer for my community. And in two, 1998, we created this maple syrup project. But we did the research, and we did it in our common lands. So we got backlash to, with that. In, the, in our common lands, how dare you use it, it's for everybody. But then I said, well, it might be for the community. Uh, so we did the research, we had a state-of-the-art um, maple syrup processing uh, facility, and which is our traditional resource. At the same time, we brought back the cultural understanding, the historical understanding of this resource. So our um, motto became blending tradition with technology, because and that's what I think our main goal is maybe how, is there a way where we can find balance today, given that, yes, this was our sacred land, but also now we also have a big population. And this is also is in line to now, we have more of an understanding, mainstream has a more understanding of the need for reconciliation. So what does reconciliation look like too? So how do we find balance? And I say you watch. Um, so Albert, uh, it's your turn. Uh, so do you think the Algonquin Nation is divided? And if so, how, how does that relate to um, the non-Native community or non-Algonquin community? Well, like I said at the opening, we're not divided. Everybody, every Algonquin wants the best for their next generations. We want health and prosperity, but we want our children and our children's children to do something about spirituality so that they could go on from this world to a better place. We're united there. And if somebody is saying that they're against development, maybe they just want to protect spirituality, their spirituality of their ancestors. As simple as that to me. You know, I've got 
five-year-old granddaughters and they have dis disagreements. They holler at each other and uh, they uh, push each other sometimes, but they work things out after a while. They, they, and, and they get along with their, and do whatever it, it was that, that first started their conflict. It's gone from them and, and, and they're united in whatever they, they decide. You know, Chief Crowfoot in 1878 said on his deathbed that life was the flash of a firefly in the night. You know, even if we live to be 100 years old, the next thing you know, you're going to be dead, right? We really have to think about that. About what happens then whenever we think about eternity and that flash of a firefly in the night that was your life. And to be united, to understand that some things just aren't worth it. How the lips. So I just wanted to say a big thank you, a big chimuwetch to everybody on this panel. I, I, I think you spoke from your hearts and you, 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 it, you were very honest. And I can't say how happy that makes me to hear everybody speak so freely about their opinions and thoughts and ideas on this. So, uh, and, and thank you for everybody for being here. So chimuwetch. Thanks everybody.